This is off planet radio. Well, there's the Zoom lady telling us this meeting is going to be recorded. Yes. Oh, they're recorded. telling me continue. Yeah, continue. Like, 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 yeah, no, you're right. It's not allowed. To no, 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 no. This. No. Like, we don't want you spying on us. Um, oh, that's right. You're spied on constantly anyway. <sighs> well, this is right. um, some version of Off Planet TV. And I'm the conspicuously absent Randy Moggins with um, my friend. Danny McKinney, who's um, secreted in the UK, I believe. Hiding out in the UK right now. <laughs> the last time we talked, you were in Malta. Yep. And um, so obviously you've, you've done some moves in that time. And um, <clears throat> this conversation is, all, as always, organic, flowing, and may go in places either dangerous or illuminating, depending on how you interpret it. You because never know the, with Randy and I where we're going to go. The nature of our personalities is such that we are basically free radicals operating in an ecosystem of wild turbulence. So, um, the I origin. Like that. Oh, I might just have to steal that. Steal that. Steal this. Yes. Yeah, steal Ooh. these. It's all open Ooh, source. I, I like that. Okay. It's all open source. So, um, but we're in good spirits. And um, I'm on the East Coast of the United States. It is morning as we're speaking, and you are in your, what, mid to late afternoon. Yeah, we're, we're it's like, yeah, three o'clock in the afternoon. And you've done us the kindness of putting on face and coming on camera. Brushed and, my hair um, and everything. I am uh, <clears throat> au natural, no makeup. <laughs> Although, you know, hey, I could glam it up at any time. But uh, the original... I guess um, purpose of this talk was for you and I to discuss some areas that you could say are contention. I don't think they're contentious. Um, I've long, probably since about 2015, harbored a great deal of suspicion, bordering at times on paranoia regarding things blockchain and crypto. Yeah. <clears throat> that position has been well staked out. Um, largely... Rightfully so. Like, that's, I think, one of the things we need to talk about. Like, you're not wrong. Right. And, and it isn't even about being right or wrong. We're going to be more pragmatic. Mm -hmm. And also because I feel I've talked to, <clears throat> for instance, back when uh, we were doing the old platform with Emily, um, we talked to Cliff High over four shows, actually five, because we did one with her friend Danny Katz. And in that time, I was still on the margins of, okay, I'm willing to hear this out. And despite my reservations about some of Cliff's woo-woo, I understand that he has a, a view of this that comes from a technical standpoint as well as I think an ideological standpoint. Mm. So by the time we concluded those particular conversations, I had kind of hardened into a place where I was like, no, fuck no, I can't do this. And in fact, <clears throat> be known that I actually destroyed, lost a paper wallet that was worth a rather substantial amount of uh, cryptocurrencies. So I basically oh, burned no. the bridge behind me with some anguish about that because it represented, it represented funds. Mm, exactly. In the angst that was that period of mourning, um, the loss of value of that. I came to equanimity by establishing that I kind of, 
I never started out doing this with anything other than I would say altruistic intentions. And I think that's true of all of the best of us. Yep. On the other hand, it has been edifying to have people support me as my patrons do. Yep. And people who have donated over the years and given of themselves a tremendous sacrifice. That would be those of you who are watching this on a patron platform. That the value of money, while it is intrinsic to our survival in this present system, is in and of itself only worth what we place into a system. Yep. And that system is now in a state of free fall, as you can see around the world. Now, this will dovetail into the strategies that you and Nick are using, um, that you have expounded and applied. And it's where I want to begin to hear a more balanced view of this than I think I myself may hold. Mm -hmm. So we started off talking about platforms and you <clears throat> you've migrated over to PocketNet, which is yep. a blockchain network that uses a specific type of cryptocurrency. Yep, their own cryptocurrency. Yep. Their own cryptocurrency, which is, I'll have questions about that. In light of the fact that we're now seeing Obviously, we've been censored, um, slammed, all of the tactics that they've used on places like Twitter, Facebook, name it, major platforms. Additionally, now what we're seeing is we're now seeing the same process occur on platforms like Telegram, where they're now censoring, and BitChute. BitChute. Now, that one surprised me. Tell us a little bit about that, because that's recent. That's in the last few days that you've encountered this. Well, I, I, and literally I went because I was supposed to have Cliff High on last night on my show. And we couldn't end up. We ended up having to reschedule because he, his Internet was just atrociously bad. He could not get Zoom to load. But just before we went live, I went to go look at something he had said. So I fired up his bit shoot, like it'd go into the bit shoot, go to, into his channel. And I got a big warning come up saying this channel has been blocked for hate speech in your area. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Shoot? In your area. Bit shoot? Are you kidding? So I immediately screenshot it, sent it over to Cliff and was like, uh -huh, you may want to take a look at this, Cliff. And he was like, what? Now, is it a tech fluke? I don't think so. No. We've seen a lot of weird tech stuff going on this week, you know, with right. cyber polygon just happening to yeah. have gone over. But I don't think it is. I think this is, I've heard too many reports now of people talking about they're coming across censorship on platforms like BitChute, like Telegram, things like that. So it's happening. It is absolutely happening. So now we're at like the next level. Down. Like everyone started on Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, and then Instagram, and then you go to the secondary backups. You know, so everyone went, okay, we left YouTube and we went to BitChute. Well, guess what? They're now being co-opted, if you will, as well. So it's where do you go, right? Which is why I ended up at PocketNet. So a couple of things about that. You obviously had that operation. What was it called again? Operation Polygon? Yeah, it was Cyber Polygon. Yeah, that yeah. was Polygon was spelled with an E on the end as in multiplicity oh. banished, gone. Gone. No, ang look, these guys are lin linguistic experts. Everything that they do. So the multiple, the multiplicity is being vanquished. Now, what I know about the internet, what I've said for years is that there technically is no internet as a single entity. The internet was originally conceived as a point-to-point -point telecommunications matrix, which under the original um, specifications of the DOJ, uh, the Defense Department, the DOD, and ARPANET in the 1960s was supposed to, quote, survive a nuclear attack. Meaning I that know was, that. Meaning, yeah, that was the original remit. Um, 
at that time during the Cold War, of course, everybody was paranoid about the nukes, which, you know, well, there was 20 years of gaslighting and a pretext to build out a system supposedly for a foreign enemy, when in fact what they were doing was weaponizing systems for the enemy inside the system. Being and, and we know that whenever they build these new systems or bring these new agencies to like Al 9-11 and then you have Homeland Security, et cetera, they never go away. Like no. the Cold War is over, but that doesn't all, everything that was built, that infrastructure doesn't disappear just because the Cold War is over. If anything, it just keeps expanding at the same ratios. And it's the same thing with everything they've done so far, right? Just here, let's, here's an excuse. Oh, we'll bring this bit of control in and we'll do this. And it never goes away, ever. Not only that, um, it deepens its tentacles into the system and intertwines. This was, um, if you're familiar with Octopus and Danny Casalero. And the whole thing that happened back in the Reagan administration uh, over software that was stolen by the by the Department of Justice, which resulted in transfers of the, the original system was called Promise Software, and the Promise Software was an extremely in the 1980s sophisticated database system. Um, beyond it was multi-layer, multi-dimensional relational database system that was literally stolen by the DOJ. Then in a technology transfer given to Israel, which then became the backdoors that were used to penetrate the banking systems, the Israelis mutated it into what was became known as Stuxnet, which they used to attack the Iranian nuclear reactors. Yep. These have been the vectors for all of these different bots, viruses, root kits, and things that have infected computer systems around the world over the last 20 years. And Danny Casalaro described the network which operated in the background regarding the co-opting of Promise Software as the octopus. It's this multi-armed, multifarious entity Mm -hmm. that would yeah. entwine in Cthulhu circle at its finest and then choke off its enemies while embedding itself into the system. So that's what we that's what we have now. A system that's so rooted and tentacled that th there's no single point. And through everything. Can... Like and through yeah. everything, right? Like there's no there's no area of life and reality that we know that you can go investigate and not find those tentacles there. doesn't matter if you're looking at education, if you're looking at finance, if you're looking at healthcare, if you're looking at anything that you look at now, if you actually dig, you find the tentacles. It's that pervasive through every step of our lives. Yeah. You look at the healthcare system, it was weaponized. How was it weaponized? It was transferred through a series here in the United States. Now it's different in Europe and Canada, I realize, because uh, the UK has had um, socialized health care since the 60s in some form. Canada likewise, since I believe the 70s to some degree. The US system was originally built on a model of what they called the blues, which were a form of healthcare that was private to the degree that it was kind of a collaboration between these insurance systems, private employers and their employees for the purposes of, you know, that was largely how we got our health insurance yeah. up until it began to morph. And the morphing point was the so-called, talk about a euphemism, Affordable Health Care Act that was brought in under Obama, but was originally envisioned by Hillary Clinton in the 1990s. It took 20 years almost to bring this in. So what they did was that in a period from 2004, time goes by fast now. I know. Um, over the last 15 years in the United States, they collapsed the original system and 
all of your small Obama made a promise, for instance, he said, if you like your doctor, you can keep him. Well, the problem with that was your doctor disappeared because yeah. a lot of doctors looked at what was coming and they had a choice. Most doctors had the choice of either a drop out of the system, retire now, close up your practice or sell your practice to the large corporate interests that were buying up all of the small practices, all of the clinics, all of the, I live one half mile here from what was for 40 years, a charitable public Catholic hospital called Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is gone. It was absorbed in stages by a giant health corporation, regional health corporation. And now in the last six months, it's been absorbed into Penn State. The... And that's happening globally, right? Yes. I okay. mean, this whole yeah, thing, like, it it's is. happening in Canada. Yeah. It's ha when, when I was in Malta in 2016, we watched the same thing where all this mega corporate, American mega corporation came in and bought all the hospitals. And I was screaming about it, as you can imagine, you know me, saying, do you people not understand? Have you done the research of who this company is and what they've already done in the States to all these small medical businesses that they just absorbed and pulled all in and morphed into these nasty, non-healthy buildings of distrust. It, it, it was crazy, mm, crazy, yeah, crazy. Yeah. yeah, I was in, so the background history is that I unfortunately got sick early in 2020, right before COVID, literally um, February 15th of 2020. And I was, I had to go to the hospital. I couldn't breathe. My pulmonary system was shutting down. And going into that hospital, I realized that I had entered the Dragon's Gate, literally. That my free will was overridden. I was literally on a psychiatric lockdown because I resisted efforts of them to administer certain tasks. I was in distress, first off. I had yeah. warned them I couldn't, be, I was literally pushed down on a table to have an EKG done on me. After I warned the technician twice, you cannot push me down like this, I can't breathe. So I was yeah. placed on psychiatric lockdown for 24 hours inside this hospital with 24 seven supervision, somebody literally sat in the room with me. I had no privacy. I was given paper clothes. Everything that I had on my person was taken from me. Um, it was surreal. And I realized in that time that, you know, I had to do an intake, I did an outtake. I was seen by mm, mental health professionals. I had very little medical care, actually. The so one they doctor, did nothing about the breathing. They, well, they did. They they remediated it. And, but I had an argument with the, the attending physician over what he was prescribing to me because, first off, I couldn't afford it. And it secondly, wasn't the most efficacious medication. And I knew that because I had done my research. And in fact, I'm not on medications at all. Yeah. Um, leaving that hospital... Then, literally two weeks before lockdown, was a somber reminder that we no longer could be part of their system anymore. Yeah. And m more to the point, now in this present year, when I've had um, a couple of scares, I'll say, and realizing I can't go near a hospital. Because if I go into the hospital... Yeah. I will be forced to have the swab shoved up into my cranium and then. And then force vaccine too. And then force vaccine. Yeah. Yep. Which is everything that I have screamed about yep. since the beginning of the whole COVID lockdown scenario. So and just this week on, on, on the unfuck it discussion, just this week, we talked about exactly that, what you just said about how many people have not gone to a hospital, have not gone to a doctor because they're terrified. Either A, on the one side, they've been completely infected with the mind virus, so they're terrified of getting COVID if they go to the hospital, 
on the other side of it, they're very, very awake and aware and have gone, if I go near that hospital, I'm, I'm, you enter their game. You are entering their game and you are going to have no choice but to, they're going to force vaccines. They're going to force these things on you. And there's been a lot of people who have died in the past year because they've been terrible. You know, like there's one thing we say, like bad medicine is bad medicine, but there's a time and a place. Mm -hmm. I have two different people I know who had someone in their family have a stroke and they ended up dying because they were too afraid. Even though the family knew there was something wrong, they were so terrified to go to the hospital. They refused to go until it was too late. Yeah. And the dialectic has weaponized this where we're now. So first off, I have a brother who is actually a rather prominent brain surgeon. He's a pediatric neurosurgeon. I know what he went through in order to become a surgeon. And I know a lot about who he is invested in this system as somebody who sees himself as a healer. And in fact, somebody who has saved the lives of, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of children over the years using his skills as a neurosurgeon. I understand that there are good people inside the system. Absolutely. I understand that the system of allopathic medicine and surgical intervention isn't inherently bad. What has become evil is that they have mind controlled the people inside of these systems into the bureaucracy and the mindset of a medical enslavement system, which declares itself literally a God now. A God. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And this is, well, I've been following, of course, as you can imagine, I'm a, every single thing that's come up with this COVID crap, I've been following closely. And all these doctors and scientists who've come forward. And one of the most amazing pieces that has come out from a medical professional against what's going on with the COVID stuff is that Dr. McCullough out of Texas. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. And it wasn't even his evidence talking about Invermectin and all the rest of it, because that's all, there's been a lot of doctors talking about that. When he first came out, one of the things he really clearly talked about was the fact that they, the quintessential they, brainwashed and propagandized the medical people first. Exactly. But And then they spread it to the public. So the fear was deeply programmed into the medical people first. Because you have to get the medics on board. You have to get the doctors, the nurses, the anesthesiologists. You need to have them completely controlled by the narrative so that when the, the bullshit starts playing out as it has done they're already mind controlled they're already programmed into it they will ignore what two years earlier they would have gone whoa 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 wait and that was the most fundamental point that i think needed to have been really put forward is that all these medical professionals they were tricked they were brainwashed just as much as the public was because they needed them to support the narrative. Otherwise the public wouldn't believe it. They were basically beginning the gaslighting even inside the medical establishments in February at the time I was there, because when I was first intake, when I first did intake into ER, the first thing that they did was slap a mask on me and I tore it off and I said, are you insane? I can't breathe. I already can't breathe. I'm not wearing this. I got very little resistance. Now, that was there then as kind of a pulse. But you see, they followed the model. One of the most successful models in modern warfare has been the outline given by the Rand Institute used in the first Iraq war, which was called shock and awe. So they understand that you have to overwhelm the energy from the enemy from an energetic and emotional standpoint first in order to affect a military victory. This is a military operation. I will remind people too, it was Donald Trump on March 13th who stated this is a live theater of operation in front of the entire nation as they were declaring the U.S. medical emergency. This was a live theater of operation. That is a very precise military term. They, that's not a, just he threw it off the top of his head. No, this was... Th- that was yeah. put in there specifically. No, exactly. Yeah. And if you're used to 
if you're used to trapping those words, which we are, because that's our, that's where we live, is in the semantics of how they operate. You then see how they weaponized the medical system and then co-opted it to move into this vector of high activity very, very quickly with everybody in, oh, wait a minute, Rockefeller is here, lockstep again. You know, yep. And the blueprints were all out there. It was there. It was there. I, that's for me like that. Dark, I have a very dark sense of humor. Sometimes that's how you protect yourself is with a very uh, dark sense of humor exactly. and a lot of sarcasm. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been putting up like memes after memes saying, you know, like, I'm sorry, but your local conspiracy theorist has been right for years, for a mm -hmm. decade. I've on my shows have been talking about all this stuff. And you're going, hello, told you, told you, told you. It was all. And now it's it's not that it's coming. It's actually here. Now, you guys, the States has been a little different. Because you've got this kind of interwar between states where one state's doing one thing, another state is doing another thing. So Texas is radically different than, say, New York or California, mm -hmm. Florida, et cetera. In Europe, in Canada, Australia, that totalitarian state is here. It's not coming. It's not um, slowly being – no, it's actually here. Canada is terrifying right now. And I, I just a cousin of mine jokingly says, so when are you going to come back to Canada for a visit? I'm like, fucking never. I'll never set foot back in that country again. Have you seen what they're doing? Have you seen what they've done? Yeah. No, I can't. I can't go back there. It's cr I can't even fathom how far it's gone in the nine years since I've been I left the country. I can't fathom it. it, it it's shocking. Shocking. Yeah, it's um, and so you know, the, the, there isn't a, a uniformity in the United States. And see, yep. that would be viewed as a great strength, and I might agree. And on some level, it's worked for us. But look at the polarity in the United States, and how that is a, a another weapon of warfare. Yes, it is. And I realize we're very far from our original remit topic here. But we're actually we, building. We warned into everyone it. that exactly. it was going to no, flow we this knew way. This was coming. We knew this was coming. Yeah. And I remember saying in 2016, and this is not about Trump or anybody else, that we were heading into this divisive period because you could feel, you could feel the tempo quickening. The very fact that. Donald Trump ran for president and was actually elected in itself. Yeah. Was like a surreal moment. And literally the night of the election, when I sat in this very chair after doing an interview with Emily, with, who was it now? Our guest that night predicted Hillary Clinton's inevitable election later that night. I'm sitting here and watching as that election ticker on CNN did this sudden zoom with a lock for Donald Trump on the electorals. And I'm like, holy fuck. Shit. Not because I wanted Hillary Clinton to be president. No, or but it was a signpost, wasn't it? It was a signpost. It was, it was a, a shift. signpost. It was mm -hmm. a shift. And it was built on a larger shift system that was occurring anyway. In other words, the energetics of everything suddenly turned in a certain way. The way I put it, because, of course, I care absolutely zero about American politics. No. Left, I, but, right, <clears throat> conservative, liberals, and all of po politics all around the world. Don't care. It's all bullshit, right? Exactly. I don't like Trump. I never did like Trump. No. For my own personal reasons and, and just my own things. But. When he won, it was a signpost. It was a signpost that showed us, it was kind of like a page marker, of, like you are here. This is, we've been watching all, and this, the storyline of everything and how we've talked about for years, how it was going to play out. And all of a sudden we got a very, very clear cut marker of like, you're not back here, you're now here. This, this is how far into it, the shit we are. This is where we are. And anyone who, 
like you said, was kind of energetically savvy enough to look at that and go, oh, wow, batten down the hatches. This is going to get really an awful lot like a roller coaster ride. And it did. And it has, and it's just escalated since then. It's yeah. just. Yeah. Oof. So we're now post Trump, obviously, or are we? No, I, no, I don't think no. so. But it's we're, all it's... we're in the interesting period where we have a synthetic president now. We have a president who is retarded. What well, just not quite human. He's he's, he's like a malfunctioning android. He's just um and yet we're okay with that. I I, I my my wanderings amidst the natives here in America convinces me that they're happy to accept whatever authority figure is dropped into their laps. They can hate them or they can love them, but they're willing to accept them. Question, and there's a big they, difference they don't there. question the method that they got there. Right, there's no, exactly. no, it was an election. It was all good. Yeah. And democracy, then, you know. And because we're polarized, and see, this was what I was getting at with the polarity here in the United States. They will use this polarity to weave us into a homogeneity at some point because the extremities can't hold. Usually yep. the old saying is the center can hold. The truth of yep. the matter is the center is solidified and the far ends of polarity themselves are collapsing. It's a Which really would, interesting dynamic energetically. I'd like it to collapse a little faster, personally. I'm kind of really done with these extremist yeah. Yeah. polarities. Yeah. Like, yeah. wow. Yeah. So that kind of brings us up here onto the horizon now where we can begin to talk about the cryptos, the blockchain, the strategies, deep prepping, mm -hmm. and what you see coming and how, because I've followed you for a lot of years and in a lot of ways, um, the people in our community, because we have overlapping communities that- um, Nicely mixed. Yeah. So we may even disagree and sometimes quite, quite, quite strongly. Yep. But the core center of this thing is that most of us have seen down the tube far enough that we knew what was coming. We know where we are. And not only that, but now we have the ability to really map out what is coming with some specificity. Yep, I agree. This is, I want to just touch on that one piece because this is one, you just, just one of my pet peeves. So I'm going to take a moment to just go into go a little it. bit of a monologue. Okay. Yeah, and that was yeah. that. Randy and I have known each other since 2014. We've mm -hmm. done shows together. You've been on my show. I've been on your mm -hmm. show. You've been on a couple of special yeah. events that I've thrown. We've known each other for a long time. I count Randy as a good friend. Do we always agree? Mm -hmm. No, we do not. And in, in some places, I'm sure that if Randy and I were to sit down and really go through shit, there'd be stuff where we'd be really in a disagreement on. But we're friends and we can talk about this stuff and we can actually have a civilized conversation about something we don't agree with because we're open-minded enough to be able to have a discourse. Yeah. And one of the biggest problems I see right now is the closing down of all discourse and discussion that people are being so divided and so separated on every level. It's like anything you want to talk about, you can throw a topic into the mix and watch the room divide into two groups mm -hmm. or three groups and be unable to come together and talk because, oh, you believe in this. Oh, well, you know, that's wrong. I don't you know, and they win. They so win. And, and when people, these co-opted bombshells that get thrown into communities, especially within the, I'm going to call it, you know, the quintessential awake community, um, are deliberately done because if you can keep people polarized arguing over whether this 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 let's argue over this tiny little piece here and disagree about it without talking about all the greater topics at hand that are more important they'll just sit here and fight and it's done deliberately and we've lost the ability a lot of people have shockingly lost the ability to have a discussion even to have a, a civilized debate 
they, they, they've lo- they don't know how to do that anymore without being offended, without getting emotional, without being triggered into having some kind of a, ah, no, I can't talk to you because you don't believe what I believe. And it's a loss to everyone in the end. Yeah. Yeah. It is um, the bifurcation of the human psyche. Yeah. We were meant to hold views as a way to reinforce and to test. It's like this. It's like the push and your muscle strengthening. So reflexively, even though there's push back, there's this collective muscle that's getting exercised. And it's that energy throws off so true. the ability to recognize on both sides, wait a minute, there's a commonality, but there's also a divergence where we can move into a different place, a different space, and think differently about the problem and the solution. And see, that's yep. why I wanted to, to have this conversation. Yep. is because I realize that I can get stuck in my own insular thinking processes. I try not to. But we and also all do. hardened. But we all do. I mean, that's kind of a fact of life. And that's what you were just saying. One of the pieces of these conversations, when we have these so-called difficult conversations with people, if you're open enough, you can expand your own comprehension of the topic. Maybe someone brings another piece to the table you've never considered before or a piece of information that you didn't know. And then you can sit there and go, oh, okay, I'm going to have to rethink this. If we can put ourselves in that place where we're not tied to a narrative, and I, I, this is my big thing continuously, of like the moment you tie yourself to a single narrative, you start excluding information that's there. You start, well, that piece of information doesn't fit with my narrative, so therefore it must be garbage. Instead of looking at it and going, okay, well, if there's this information and this one, how do those work together? How do those pieces fit together? And that's one of my biggest things is like being able to drop the narratives and the belief structures. And I mean, it's an ongoing lifetime process because we always find little pieces. I even to this, to this day, I always find a little piece where you, a word comes out of your mouth and you go, did I just say that? Yeah. Where did that come from? Oh, I need to look at that piece. Why am I feeling that triggered or that tied to this one thing? There must be something there. Yeah. That's the unconscious speaking. That's the place that it, I don't know how much you know about what I'm doing right now. First off, I'm writing a book, which I have no idea how to write a book. I have some people that are coaching me in it. Good. But I, in the midst of doing this, this was like a deep research project. And I was like, OK, we need to take this apart and research this and look at that and stacks and stacks of information. And something happened and something came in and I'm writing holy shit, there was a whole flow of information that started to come in from the unconscious. Mm-hmm. It wasn't mine. It was mine. And it felt familiar. There, but what was coming through was a really deep place that said, wait a minute, how much more information can you amass, compile, abstract, and then put out? Or do you want to process this on another layer. Mm. And it became what is now called the receiver series, which is this voice, which, you know, I really resist calling it channeling because I don't trance and I'm not tapping into I know what you're talking thing. about. This no, became I what I came to understand because I questioned it, I pushed back. I actually did a lot of writing and a number of podcasts where I didn't even acknowledge this. And finally I was like, okay, what the fuck is this? What I came to understand is that over the course of the last year, because of a lot of deep healing that I'm doing on a lot of layers, I'm healing from uh, childhood trauma, sexual trauma, trauma on a psychic level which we all need to go through, whatever your circumstances are. You know, this is especially true for people who have been in programs that at some point it breaks down. And then when it breaks down, you have to rebuild from that place. 
And as I've gone through this, I've had to tap into things, including ancestral knowledge and breaking ancestral ties and bonds and curses. And this was something that my wife was telling me that she had begun to do. And what began to come through was, first off, we'll call it the higher self or the oversoul, the part of you that is non-local, that sits out there, that yeah. is you, but also is a greater part of you because you're an individuated consciousness. Yeah. Then there is the ancestral aspect. And then there is the other aspects of you that are the fragments of self that you are pulling in to reintegrate into this personality yep. core. It's a really strange process. Uh -huh. When they begin to converge, you begin to gain another form of, of knowing, of knowledge, because you then begin to move into the intuitive empathic mode. Mm -hmm. And so these voices were coming in and beginning to flesh out things I kind of knew but didn't know or was afraid to say. Mm -hmm. And it became, and I've been trying to be transparent about this. On one level, this is a real phenomena. It's a real thing. But if you want to accept it as a fictional device, I'm willing to accept that as well. Whatever works. Because yep. fiction is one of our most powerful means to communicate. It's yeah. what they have weaponized against us. We need to reverse the tables. So in all of that, what we're gaining knowledge of now isn't just what is in our local sphere or what okay. is in front of us in the 3D world. We're pulling not only now from the psychic, the cosmic, the internal unconscious, but now we have this digital realm. And this digital realm is interesting. And I have to admit, somewhat scary and everything inside of me wants to run from it but i realize we are engaging with it yep okay so it's everything you've just said is so interesting because you and i have <laughs> obviously you're talking to your audience and i'm always talking to my audience and we don't we haven't really talked together like this in right, a couple of right. years right but we have commonalities and, and that's so with the commonalities yeah. and these conversations, all the stuff I've just, we've talked about this so much, the unfuckers and I, and that's. And see, I don't know that. No. And, but it, here's the thing is I have a, this, my own piece and we all visualize or use words to describe things differently. You have your own way of describing what you've been through mm -hmm. and how you are collate information, et cetera. I have my own way because that's what works in my thing. It doesn't. And this is one of those things where we get sometimes get caught up in words and disagree. What in the reality is we're describing the exact same thing. Exactly. We're just that's using true. our own yeah. metaphors, if you will. Yes. Right. So to me, it's like when we talk about that greater consciousness, whatever you want to call it, oneness, or you want to call it whatever source consciousness, whatever, pick a name. I don't care. That consciousness of our own that is out side of us and yet is part of us but outside of us when things are going through when it's the right time that information goes out and either you pick it up or you don't and i use the example of for example inventors where all of a sudden you'll have a multiple people all working on the same invention mm -hmm. all at the exact mm -hmm. same time yeah. um, my husband is is prime nick is prime for that because he's done so many things that he's invented and blueprinted out etc cetera, etc cetera. And then, you know, a year later, two years, someone has actually built it and patented it. And it's like, oh, look, they've done it again. The consciousness brings the information out. And it's the same thing I feel right now. And it's gotten very, very, for me personally, it's gotten very, very strong in the last year and a half where I can, when I'm talking on the show, because I'm, I do like this, like, when we do our shows, it's totally unscripted. It's whatever topic comes to the surface. That's what we're going to talk about in the moment. And when I find myself talking about certain things and all of a sudden I'll find myself talking about, this is what's going to happen. This, da, 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 da. And I can, I can, I know that I'm drawing it from somewhere else. I know that I'm drawing mm -hmm. it from somewhere else, but I also know it. Like I, I can, like, I know this information and is it channeling? No, it's not channeling. Is it, 
you know, intuitive. High, yeah, sure. You call it whatever you want. The, the end result is the fact of when you get in touch with this intuitive center, this knowing you bring forth and, and it's a matter of not blocking yourself, right? Allowing yourself to actually come and say some of these things. And at first you get, you're a little like, I don't want to say that because if I say that people are going to freak the fuck out <laughs> and I've stopped exactly. like, now I've been yeah. like, no, I'm just going to yeah. say it. I'm just going to let it flow. And it's really interesting, especially in this last year is I have said things and then watched as there's been just a whole wave of people saying the very similar things, what they're mm -hmm. feeling coming along, um, what they're feeling coming in. And it's, again, they describe it maybe a little differently. They have different terminology, analogies to describe it, but it's in reality, the same thing. That's when you know that consciousness is moving people. And well, if you're really in tune to it, you see it. There was just reports came out this week. So I'm here in England and I'm very close to Birmingham that the shelves in Birmingham and the grocery stores were fucking bare. People were like freaking out. People were power buying, et cetera, et cetera. Well, why is that? There's been no major announcements of like impending doom from the British government, et cetera. And I said last night when I was chatting with a bunch of the unfuckers that people, no matter how asleep they are, they're feeling it. Mm -hmm. They're feeling that something is coming. They, even if it's completely on an unconscious level, they don't know why they're buying extra rolls of toilet paper or why they feel the need to, to stash food or water, et cetera. Because people are picking up on it. Like the, the consciousness of the planet, if you will, is now spreading that message, if you will, that, that, that uh, like, okay, guys, hang on to your hats. Shit's about to get real. Yeah. So that people, even who are very much not aware of these things, they're feeling it themselves. And if they're even slightly intuitive, they're picking up on it and acting on it, even if they don't understand why they're doing it. And that's that actually nature, by the way. This is how nature yeah. works. If you watch the birds in the fields, I learned this as a kid on my grandparents' farm. You'll know when a storm's coming long before the sky gets cloudy because two things, yep. leaves on trees turn over and birds yep. begin to amass and circle and fly in formation long yep. before the storm hits. Cows lay down. This is <laughs> Spiders start dancing weirdly. Exactly, yeah. This is the energetic on Earth now. Nature is integrating with the human unconscious in a way that we've we've not experienced because civilizations have dulled those senses. Mm. The energy coming in on, on the earth, and this was one of the things that I've tracked with my research, was how these cosmic energies began spiking around, well, you can argue when they began. I, I go back to the eclipse in 2017. Oh, which was you stop it, Randy? Which was seriously? The, this was the entry point. <laughs> we are so talking about all the same stuff, like on, on parallel paths. It's hysterical. Sorry, you're cracking me up. Right yeah, now. no, no. So we are in this level, and as human beings, we have not experienced the energetics because of a lot of reasons. This is evolution of human consciousness on steroids now. Yeah. This is the apocalypse. I mean, it's not St. John's version necessarily. It's more like the real version. It's like well, shit the unveiling, here. right? Like, I mean, unveiling. that's apocalypse. Yeah. What that's means. what it really the is. Unveiling. Yeah. Take so a look at what your reality really is. So strategically, even though we don't know what is orchestrating this, we respond to it energetically. Mm -hmm. And this is both sides of the stratum. This is the so-called awakened people, not the woke people, the awakened yes, people. To, to define that very clearly. And it is those who are on this side that are just step, stepping through life. I, I won't use lockstep again. Stepping through life. But the field effect is that the high end of the energy is pulling along the mass. And this mm -hmm. is the old argument about the tipping point, the three to 5% yep. that's required to tip the rest of yep. the crowd, 
the, the mass. The, yep. In other words, no mass awakening is necessary, nor is it even possible. I agree. It's a futile as it's a futile aspect of, of this whole thing that we've done of trying to wake people up to red pill. You can't do it. No. The real thing was to to mobilize it inside of ourselves and then find our tribes. And that's yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we've Community. done. That's why. Yeah. So we get to this place now. We're on digital platforms. We we were gifted a technology. This is the receivers have told me this, this technology was gifted to you. Oddly enough, by that which you would consider to be the enemy, you know, the deep state, engineered a system in the 1960s, really in the 1950s. And we were given devices, <clears throat> technologies, <clears throat> which some developed organically and some were technologies that were basically handoffs. So you have Silicon Valley as an example of that. It doesn't matter how it came into being. Yep. The technology is old technology anyway from a, a hardware platform standpoint. I saw digital devices when I was a kid that I didn't understand until the 1990s when I saw LCD flat screen computers. The technology existed. It was nevertheless, what it was really doing was the hardware connecting what T.R. Duchardin called the newosphere, which is the human network. Mm. This is the hard wiring, all of the technology, all the layers of technology, is just a formalization inside the physical atmosphere of something that already existed. So we're enmeshed in technology and it's toxic technology, but we will survive it. And that's, the, that's kind of where I meet you in saying, I think I philosophically disagree, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> with, um, for the most part, cryptos, at least the way they're presented. Aha, uh -huh, that's it. But see, something happened in that exchange that we had, which led to this interview. Mm -hmm. Your husband, Nick, came in. Being the reasonable man that he is, he posited something very interesting about the strategic aspects of this. And this comes right into where we are right now and how we have to begin to look at things. And this is where I say to you, explain it to me, Danny. Okay, so here's the thing. <clears throat> we can hypothesize. And I think this is one of the things that's happened with cryptos and blockchain technology is it's become one of those, very much those divisive, uh, uh, subjects where all these little bombs have been dropped in, where people are arguing, well, is it this or is it this? Where is it this or is it this? Where is it? And they've gotten so lost in the minute pieces that they're losing track of, of the bigger picture. So they've zoomed in so tightly. If you back it back out and look at it, it be becomes a different picture. So one of the things is that I know that the conversation was on your wall when we were on, on this on Facebook is how it is presented is exactly that. The present presentation, and I became aware of Bitcoin in 2011. Yeah. And I started really myself, digging yeah. into it. And I was like, I don't trust this fucking shit. And I put out a big expose in November of 2012 when I was watching a new show, a Toronto new show. I was living in Toronto at the time. It was a Toronto news show. And they had some guy who was one of the blockchain programmers for Bitcoin. And he said on the show, we are working with the, with, with, you know, the bankers, like the FCC, the, the, like, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the SEC, sorry, the SEC, FCC, SEC. SEC. And I said, ha ha, hello, everyone. They've just admitted that they're working with, the SEC, they're working with the big boys. So therefore, all of you who are saying, this is the freedom, this is going to empower, this is going to free everyone, blah, 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 you're wrong because it's still just controlled. It's controlled. Mm. So I was very leery. And I wouldn't touch. I watched, watched, watched. And Nick, my husband, was like really closely watching all the articles that were coming and going. 
a lot of people are still stuck in the argument is is bitcoin good or is it bad who controls it who doesn't control it what is it is it a means that it's going to be the the ultimate control that's going to enslave us all here's the thing what it really breaks down to is it is a new financial system now people put out tons i see it all the time on social media Oh, Bitcoin is used for pedophiles and it's used in the dark web to fund drugs and murder and rape. And I'm like, okay, seriously, have you ever researched the Canadian dollar, the the American dollar, the Canadian dollar, the British pound? Because it's this, it's the old adage, right? Of like, like guns don't kill people. People kill people. It's what Mm -hmm. people do with it. So we have this new, form of currency and i will be like nick said to you and i will back that up to the hilt and say are they going to use cryptocurrencies as a way to try and kill off cash as a as give to take control of people's finances yeah that's where it's going you can guarantee they don't allow this kind of a thing to happen this kind of shit doesn't happen organically if it is crypto market is building to the point that it is where you have Bezos and Elon Musk and you have Apple and you now you know all playing the game, all publicly talking, when you have all the big named people t- talking about buying in, yay, you know that it is part of their plan. Having said that, right now we're off in the early days of crypto. We're in the very, very early days of crypto. And for people who've invested, so Nick and I started investing a little bit and we're we're dead broke. We're we're completely broke. We're always broke. We have four teenagers. We're completely (laughs) fucking broke. Um, Yeah, I understand. You know, you, 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 we invested a little bit. So my, my skincare company, um, I had certain clients who would pay in cryptocurrencies and I would put those into my wallet and put them to the side. So I think maybe overall we invested a grand total over a couple of years of about 650 euros, maybe 700 euros in total. That's really modest. Yeah. It, yeah. It, and it was just a little bit here, a little bit there. Now, Nick is very savvy and he's taken that and he's traded it to the point of we have, we took some out in February. We bought ourselves a car. We paid for a year's car insurance insurance which cost us a fucking fortune in england i just yeah, want to say um right so we took that out of the system out of that digital ether imaginary reality if you will turned it into physical cash we, we then bought something that helped my family mm-hmm. we needed a vehicle our car had died we needed insurance it's a tool And as I've said, and I've said it so many times um, on my shows, yes, they're controlling the tool to a certain extent, not all of the tools, because there's lots of uh, other tools that have been put out there that are doing amazing, that are tied to amazing projects like PocketNet. Yes, some of you look at Bitcoin. Yeah, it's a tool. It's no doubt it's their tool. And they plan on using it for probably nefarious reasons just as they did with the petrodollar, just like they did when they got rid of gold and and went on the pure fiat system. Mm -hmm. But we're still in that system. We still had to work. Even when, you know, when gold was shut down and we went to the, the, the fake, fake, fake as it can be fiat currency money, we still had to work in that system. We still had to buy food. We still had to put a roof over our head, food on the table, et cetera. When we went To work at a job, we were paid in that fake funny money. It was part of that system. And one of the analogies, I'll get to that in a second. So you use it as a tool. Right now, we have done, my family, we've done really, really well. We've got a nice balance. We've been able to do what we're just buying and Nick making the right moves because he does a shit ton of research. He watches the crypto markets. And has done since 2016, like a hawk. So he's able to now intuitively, and myself, go in and go, that is, I like that project. We're going to 
pay into we're going to get buy a little bit of this that we're very much hoping to be able to take it very very soon and buy a piece of property to buy a farm mm -hmm. that's how much we've been able to grow mm -hmm. on take it out of the system i have no problems using their system against them to look after my family and then say fuck you to them and walking out and that is where i sit with the whole thing with the cryptos there's certain things for example one of the things that we have in our crypto wall is we have invested in ripple ripple is the central bankers fucking cryptocurrency i hate ripple i hate everything it stands for because it's the bankers crypto but in watching the trends nick could see what was coming he said that is going to take off that is going to take off and i have no problems buying it down here and when it gets to our price that we've got in our own head saying okay when it reaches this we're just going to dump it we're going to sell everything and take the cash out of the system and we will be independent off grid doing what the hell we want to do with our family and fuck them and all the shit that they're trying to do if back when microsoft first came out mm -hmm. somehow you had an inside mm -hmm. insider who said you want to buy this stock, buy Microsoft stock when it's like 10 cents and you listen to them and you bought that stock and then Microsoft skyrockets to what it is now. And you were able to take that money out and use that money to support yourself, to support your family and your work that you're doing to be able to expand the work that you're doing into doing more projects that are for the betterment of what we want to do. Is that a bad thing? We can sit there and say Microsoft is fucking evil of evil. It's Bill Gates and my God. Da, da. Yeah, but we but, didn't know that in the 1980s. No, you we didn't. Old, well, maybe a little bit. Yeah, maybe. A, we know maybe the a Gates family the wasn't. Yeah, but we were sold an image of a nerd yeah. who founded a software company. The, the truth of that is so far from having learned a lot about the tech industry having been in it at some level, I learned a lot about how it functions and yeah. the mythologies that are built around it and even the witchcraft that's involved with it. Um, yeah, if you had known that, had you known about what Apple was going to do? Even how Apple turned around after the 1990s when they sucked balls. I mean, Apple was just like, they were horrible. And the return of Steve Jobs, which took Apple and just catapulted it into the strat stratosphere, where now they're the most profitable corporation in the world. Yeah. But any of this, no, it is not wrong, because this is the system that we were given. And within the system, there have to be just opportunities. This is the system that we were given. It's put in front of us. And for me, like I said, because for I was, when you opened the whole show and you talked about, we got into this for altruistic reasons, for both of us. And I remember back in 2012, I did not have a donation button on my site because I felt it would be bad. Mm -hmm. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't, yes, no, no, no. It's, I, I didn't monetize my, my videos because no, no, because it would look, it's no, I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it for, and I, it took actually, a bitch slapping from a viewer who became a really good friend of mine who unfortunately passed two years ago. And he went off at me in my Skype room back 2012. <laughs> and he said, how dare you tell me that I can't give you some money? How dare you make a choice for me? And you telling me what you can and can't, that I can't do. If I feel that I should want to send you some money to look after what, the work that you're doing to say thank you, you have no right to tell me I can't. Mm, wow. And I had this whole, whole, like that like kind of free will choice. And you went, holy shit. Like it was, I had a huge moment there. Of, wow. And we had a lot of, he and I had a lot of conversations over the next couple of years where he really, he had a brilliant mind for being able to kind of get into those kind of topics. We, all of us in this, doing what you and I do, we live day to day, week to week, month to month, yeah. 
to yeah. pay mortgages and rent and to put food on the table. And yet we spend hours upon hours upon hours a week putting out the information, doing the work that we do to try and help people. And it's a trap. And I think it's a real new age trap to fall into that, I don't need to be paid for this altruistic ideology. We live in a reality where to look after our families, we have to have money. Yeah. And that system is there. So going back to crypto. Not only that, but as you know, and I've watched you go through this and I've gone through it, we've had to invest to buy computers. You've got to buy cameras. Oh my you God. can't just go buy a, a $199 computer to do video editing. No. I know what you went through specking a computer because I watched it. I had to drop almost $2,000 yeah. on a computer that would be able to run video editing software, plus do all of the other things, video software, um, exactly. audio editing. I mean, I bought the entire Adobe thing on with the computer as licenses in order to be able to do what I needed to be able to do yep. the transition into video. Very expensive. I'm sitting here right now in front of $5,000 worth of equipment. Yep. Most of it out of my pocket. Mm -hmm. Some of it bought at a time when I didn't exactly have all that money. Yeah. It and we was, have websites that we build and like yeah. I, you're and you're buying software and plugins and you're continuously. No, this is it. Like, it's not. Um, it's not. Free. No, it's not. To be able to do what we do. And not only that, like I'm a homeschooling mom. So like all the time that I do researching is times that I'm not with my kids that I'm not yeah. working on my company, my skincare company. Mm -mm. This last three weeks, I've been so heavily involved in working online with all of the stuff that I've been doing um, and getting information out and putting out videos, et cetera, that like I've neglected my own skincare company. I haven't been doing any marketing. I, so of course, sales have gone down, which means it's less money coming in to support the work that I'm doing. So- mm -hmm goes back to again and i'll use pocket net as an example i went to pocket net when they first launched so pocket net for anyone who doesn't know is is a social media it started as a social media platform um and it's been expanding ever since it started in early 2019 and it's built on the blockchain and it is decentralized it does not have a centralized server so therefore it can't be taken down. Your post can't be removed. It can't be, even if, for example, let's say America decided to outlaw pocket net and close down whatever nodes they could find, it wouldn't matter because the entirety of the website is carried on thousands of nodes right. all over the planet. So big tech can never take it down. And because it was on for me, because I do a lot of artwork too, like I do a lot of artistic stuff and I've had so many of my designs stolen. Um, and you would know this when you're dealing with anything that's copyright artistic work. That right, you've done, right. You need time, time date stamped. So if you put your artwork up onto a blockchain, i.e. pocket net, it is time date stamped. So if anyone comes along afterwards and tries to steal your t-shirt design or your piece of music or your literary, whatever it is that you've done, You've got proof. Like you can go like, huh, here's the blockchain. This is when I yeah. published it. It's mine. Yeah, this is evidence of prior art. Exactly. So for me, like these were the barest aspects. And when I first got on Vault, they didn't, they, they had like a pocket coin, if you would call it that. Like they had counters of what you would get, <clears throat> but there was no cryptocurrency yet. So all it was was empty numbers on a screen. And I got to know, because I was one of the very first people on the site, um, I got to know the devs really well. And I mm -hmm. interviewed a couple. I, I interviewed one of them quite often. And we talked about it. And I got to talk to him off camera a lot. And his story is very, very interesting. Is that he immigrated and basically his family escaped from Soviet Russia yeah. when he was a young man. 
and he went to the States and he learned IT and he learned all this to be able to do all this. He got involved in technology, et cetera. And then he watched over the last decade as America started looking more and more like communist Russia. And he took his family and he got the fuck out. And he laughed. He was like, no, no, no. I see where this is going. I've been there. I've done that already. I'm not doing it again. And he laughed. And censorship was a real big thing to him, which is why he did PocketNet. So censorship, PocketNet is completely 100% censorship free. There is no censorship on the site. The site itself is a community and we censor what's going on. I, if someone comes on and posts porn, it will get reported as this is like seriously not allowable and it will end up through the reporting process automatically being removed. But there's no censorship. Whatever your opinion is, Say what you're going to say. That's the way it is. Now, they've just launched over the last year, they launched their cryptocurrency, which is tied to it. And I found myself with a very tidy sum of crypto of, of these coins going, look at that. I have at the time the coins were worth 12 cents, sometimes nine cents. Well, yeah. earlier this year, the, the, as they launched their video platform, the price skyrocketed at one point to over $8. And even the critics are saying because of the platform and what's behind that cryptocurrency, i.e. pocket net, everything it has to offer, it could very well easily hit $10 and could very well hit a hundred dollars within the next couple of years. Wow. So for me, I'm sitting there, I doing on PocketNet what I've just done on Facebook and letting them steal all my information and et cetera, on Twitter, et cetera. I'm doing the exact same thing, but now I'm actually earning something. And that was the money I took out to buy a car. And I took out pocket coin when it was hit, uh, I guess it was about 78 cents. And I took some pocket coin out and I bought a car for the family. And I bought the year's worth of insurance and I turned it into a tangible asset for my family mm -hmm. for something that I'd been doing. And this is one of those pieces, right? So now we're, we're talking, I can't remember if it was before we started recording or not. The first level of, you know, what we all used was Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera, YouTube. And then all the censorship came in. So everyone dropped to the next level. So like, going to Telegram, going to BitChute, going to a lot of these other sites, um, Parler, MeWe. Oh, well, guess what? Now they're all getting hit with the censorship stuff as well now. So we're getting hit with these levels where there's becoming fewer and fewer places where you can actually not just say what you want to say, put the information out, but know that it's safe, that it's not going to get just... Yeah wiped off the face of the internet. And at the same time, I'm actually earning something that is spendable to support my family. So when I get back to the whole conversation again, whether we're using fiat currency or cryptocurrency, it's all controlled by them. Does it really matter? We still have to put food on the table. And if I can use the tools smartly that are there to put more food on the table for my family. I'm going to take that. And that was the realization I had. And it was Nick, my husband, who was the one who finally got me to see it, that for all this stuff that I built up in my head about Bitcoin is bad. Well, so is the American dollar. So is the pound sterling. Yeah. Yeah. We're inside of a system which corrupts everything that it touches. Absolutely. Uh, and what I thought was interesting in you talking about it the way you have is in a sense, this is a manifestation. All you new agers out there who have, can't seem to manifest shit. The reason why is because, and, and this is me, this intellectual purity thing but can't touch that system see that's kind of for me that's kind of baked in religion 
which I'm yeah. still throwing off as well. I mean, I have I the we programming of a fundamentalist background, which I say, ooh, that's the devil. You can't touch that. And I've kind of, you know, I've even said, what if this is the mark of the beast? I mean, well, yeah. it kind, kind of is. But it's kind of everything else is too. Exactly. And that's why I keep going about going, how many American dollars have been used to fund wars? If you want to talk about the mark of the beast, the IMF is right there. SDR basket of currencies. There's your mark of the beast. Like, I mean, if you really, really want to, like you said, these are tools that they're out there. And you said it about the internet, right? Mm -hmm. Those tools were given to us per se by the shadowy elites who we don't like. But we use those tools and we use them to our benefit. We use them. We, we, we take that and, and we twist those around and we yeah. fucking use them in a very positive way to make a difference because it's how you use the tool. And that is where fundamentally where I come back to with cryptos. We're, yes, it could, they can be all the bad guys and the bankers. You got fucking Elon Musk and his Dogecoin. I love Dogecoin. I'm totally a Dogecoin. Like, <laughs> woohoo! I'm, my, it, I'm mystified it, by it, but I have paid to me a lot this of, one, fuck yeah. of a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Dogecoin seemed to me to be very interesting because I watched it. Uh, uh, I watched it in the crypto groups on Reddit. Yeah. of how it just kind of spun off. It was like it came out of nowhere. It was a shit coin. It was just a joke. Yeah, it was a joke. And maybe that's, you know, ultimately, maybe that's the takeaway. It's the joke is we can make a joke. What was that old BG song? I started a joke. Um, there I you... started a joke. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, whole world laughing. Uh, Shane Bales, that's the name of his podcast. Um, but the joke was that the joke was real and then the joke became serious. And why do we go to see stand up comedians? Because they tell us things about ourselves and our world that are true. The, and they make us laugh. The court jester was the one in the king's court who could tell the truth to, in front of the king and not yep. be beheaded. So it was yep. a joke. Yep. Yeah. So there is this extraction of value from everything. That is actually, this, you know, this is a conversation we've had in my groups before about alchemy and how alchemy mm -hmm. is an extraction mm -hmm. of taking the essence of something, just as you would extract from plants in order to yep. get the medicinal benefit. You don't use the whole plant. There's parts of it that are pulp and there's parts of it that you don't want, but you need the essential of that. Yep in order to extract from it. And in everything, there is an essence, there's a spirit. I've said this for a long time. There is a spirit of the technology. It may be a dark spirit, but dark spirits are like that, we were adversarial, that adversarial push and pull that flexes muscles and causes us to become stronger. Yep. There's yep. a lot of metaphors at play here. Yeah, absolutely. And that's how I kind of see it. And like I said, when it comes down to it, when we talk, when we say about cryptos, is it's, I have to feed my family. And the fiat currency isn't doing it anymore. Right? Like your chances of making money as a small business myself, as a small businesswoman, the chances of making money are just disappearing and drying up every month that goes by, especially since the last 18 months. Because as everyone else is getting broke, well, guess what? For me, they don't buy skincare because that's considered a luxury, right? So if someone, oh, when all of a sudden the economy is that bad, people aren't buying what they consider to be not a necessity. I still have to feed my family. The tools are there at hand. And I am personally more than willing to use those tools to my advantage to look after my family. Like I said, and when I'm done with that tool, I'm more than happy to take it and go, don't need you anymore because now I'm independent. Now I can get to a place where I'm independent. And that's my, my when we talk about manifesting and intent, like that's my daily mantra. 
is I will get my piece of land. I will get my farm where I will be doing incredible projects. I have so many projects that are all up here ready to roll out. Just need that piece. And I know, know that it's coming. I know that piece is coming. Mm. So that comes from that inside voice. Okay. I'm willing to listen to that inside voice and not limit how I put, how that comes into being. And we talk about manifestation. And I always kind of joke about the fact of sometimes we limit ourselves mm. because we can only picture something happening in one specific way. So we say, okay, well, I want all these steps to happen so I can get here to this goal. Whereas instead of met, putting your intent just on reaching that goal and let the universe kind of show you a completely different path to get there. That's where I'm sitting now. It's like, I know where my goal is. My focus is on that goal because I have a shit ton of work to do and I know where I want to move forward to. And I know it will come to be. I know it will happen. And I will let it, it roll out as it does. And we'll see. I personally think Think it's going to happen through cryptos who knows maybe i'll get fucking lucky and win the lottery not that i've ever bought a <laughs> ticket but you know yeah, yeah let me ask you a question um you just summarized a lot of the things that we came in to do um and i want to leave it with that because i want people to have that vision that you just planted there can you come back for another brief segment with me of course okay Let's Anything do that. For you, darling. Anything yeah, for you. this is um, so that's going to wrap up the public side. Those of you on YouTube or wherever else you find this, if you want to hear the full conversation, you can drop over to patreon.com forward slash Randy Moggins. And there's a lot of material there that you just might want to partake in. So we'll do that. The truth is out there, it's inside you. Go look for it. Go look for it. This is Off Planet Radio.